Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Beistrack. I'm the superintendent of schools for the West Seneca Central School District. Uh, we welcome all of our families and community members that are joining us for this live stream event today. Uh, as uh, everyone knows who's tuning in, we're here to talk a little bit about uh, the New York State Department of Health's updated guidance and how it impacts our school's ability to be able to bring kids in uh, on a more uh, consistent or more regular basis into school, an uh, increasing amount of time. So. Uh, before we go ahead and get started, I just want to introduce the other folks that are in the room with me here today. Uh, to my left, we have Mrs. Fowler. Uh, she is our Assistant Superintendent for Exceptional Education. We have Mrs. Persico. She's our Assistant Superintendent uh, for Educational Operations. We have a few of our elementary principals here today, too. I'm going to introduce them, but I just want to say that it's, uh, they have a very busy job today. There's a lot of transition going on in our buildings as our elementary parents are away as we prepare to bring in some new elementary students. So, uh, But they were able to break away just briefly for this today. We have Mrs. McCartan, who is the principal over at Clinton Street Elementary. We have uh, Dr. Quinn, who is the principal over at Allendale Elementary. And then we have Mrs. Brady, who is the principal at Winchester Elementary. And again, our other two elementary principals are extremely tied up right now. Otherwise, they'd be here as well. Uh, and finally, we have Dr. Cervoni, who is our assistant superintendent for administrative operations as well. So uh, anyway, just again, welcome to everyone. So uh, kind of how we structured this uh, was basically that we had an email address that parents have been emailing and community members have been emailing questions to over the past uh, week or so since we first announced this. Um, and uh, so I've actually kind of created two different documents that I'm working off. One of them is a PowerPoint uh, that I'm going to be uh, referring to here. It's the West Seneca Draft Reopening Plan. Uh, we won't be finalizing this until probably tomorrow, as I would anticipate the date. You know, we want to take in some additional feedback and respond to some questions. Um, and then I have another document which I've kind of pulled. It's all of the questions uh, that have been asked so far, uh, which I'll get to kind of secondly. Uh, and then also uh, we have a few folks that are on laptops, if you saw, as we kind of went around the room, they may be, uh, if we have some time, we'd like to be able to take some live questions if people have them. Uh, so I have, I, I did a video message last week, last Friday, I'll be doing another one this Friday as well, uh, that addressed some of these questions. We did a Board of Education presentation last night that I think got at a lot of these questions as well. Uh, but if anybody's just tuning in for the first time, we also, by the way, sent a, a, a kind of a frequently asked questions document out on Monday night. Uh, but if anybody's just kind of tuning into this for the first time, hopefully this will answer uh, your, all the questions that you have. The other thing I'll just say, too, if you do have a question, you're a parent, it, it's never a bad thing. You can always reach out to your building principal as well. I'm going to speak kind of globally and broadly to sort of the impact the new guidance has, uh, you know, with our students in our district. Um, but, you know, there's going to be some individual nuances and uh, parts of the plan just based on the fact that every building is a little bit different, the configuration and whatnot. So... Anyway, uh, without further ado, I think I'll go ahead and get, uh, get into it. So, so again, our draft reopening plan. If the, the New York State guidance that came out on April 9th, uh, basically Department of Health, uh, CDC puts out their guidance, and then the New York State Department of Health on April 9th put out their guidance. So Department of Health really is who we would answer to more so than the CDC. So that's why we're able to make some of these changes. Um, so our update in the plan doesn't rehash the whole plan because, frankly, there, there, there were most of the plan really is still pretty much intact. Uh, some of the bigger changes are what we're going to talk about today. So physical distancing was, was really a big portion of that. That was probably the biggest game changer for us, especially at the elementary level. Uh, physical barriers, that's another area we're going to discuss. Uh, face masks, ventilation and filtration, and field trips, just some other areas to talk about. We will be discussing some other items too, like transportation and lunches and things like that as well. So physical distancing. So one of the biggest uh, changes that I mentioned earlier was uh, what the physical distancing requirements are. So how it works is that elementary, they kind of delineate between elementary students and secondary students. Elementary being elementary students that are actually physically attending elementary schools. Secondary students being students that physically attend middle and high schools. So for students uh, that in an elementary, they can be three feet apart now, down from six feet, okay, regardless of the, infect, the COVID infection rate in a particular community or county. Um, at the secondary level, in middles and high, middle and high schools, they can be three feet unless you are in a county that is in a high uh, COVID-19 transmission rate or infection rate, which Erie County currently is uh, by, by a long shot at this point. So Erie County is still in this high transmission rate. Therefore, uh, the only way that our middle and high school students can... Uh, take advantage of the three feet of distance as if they are what, they, what they, they call cohorted. It can be a little confusing because we kind of talk about our A and B cohort, but a cohort essentially is a group of kids, a small group of kids kind of transitioning uh, throughout the course of their school day from one class to another, and those kids always stay together. Um, 
frankly, we're just most school districts, uh, you know, really aren't able to accommodate that at a secondary level. There, there are a few, I think, at the middle school that have been able to do it, in, you know, around the area, but I'm not aware of, you know, a lot of high schools that are able to do this. So, and I can tell you that our we're not we're not built that way. Uh, so, really, at this point, the bulk of this presentation is really going to focus on our elementary school students because that's where we have the flexibility. So, uh, again, to go back to this, they can be three feet apart uh, within our classrooms. There are some caveats to that, though, which I'll get to in a moment. So again, getting back to the uh, physical distancing, kind of how West Seneca is going to look to implement this plan is really we're just, you know, we've been working and measuring kind of in anticipation of this guidance change. For the past several weeks, our elementary principals have been working with our teachers and our buildings and grounds departments uh, really to try to reconfigure classrooms. And you might think, well, three feet of distance, that's easy, you know, but it, it's not as easy as you think, especially in an elementary building. I mean, I can tell you that it's taken some creativity on uh, all of our parts to make sure that, that we can make this work. Uh, the one thing I will add is that adults need to continue to maintain six feet of distance between one another and between themselves and their students. It adds another little wrinkle here. It's just another restriction that limits our ability to be able to maneuver and, and, and be within you know, some of our spaces. So, but we're going to make it work. So again, some other, another notable change too that I think uh, was welcome news to a lot of our folks in our physical education department and our music departments uh, is that the required distance between uh, students uh, in those classes is not one, it was 12 feet. So if you're in phys ed class or, you know, if you're in band, uh, you had to be 12 feet. Now it's six feet of distance. Again, just between one another, uh, adults still need to remain, well, they, everybody's six feet at that point, I guess. So, uh, and in the common areas, this is another area as well. So like your lobbies, auditoriums, gymnasiums, the big one is cafeterias, to be honest with you, and our hallways still have to be six feet apart. I can tell you this posed a particular challenge uh, for us and for all the other school districts in the cafeterias, because right now we're set up to be six feet apart, but that's with half the kids. Uh, now we're in a situation where we're trying to be creative with our use of spaces. So uh, a parent, one of our parents had asked the question, hey, can you, can you give us a little bit of specifics as, as far as how you're going to get at that? I can tell you that it's going to look a little different in every building. Uh, some parents may be driving by may have noticed some tents uh, set up outside of our buildings. In some cases, despite the fact that there's snow on the ground right now, we're expecting that to melt very soon. Um, and you know, we're entering a pretty warm time of year. So when our kids go outside for recess and things like that, even in the middle of the winter when it's 30 degrees. So uh, you know, that's one area that's going to give us some additional flexibility potentially for meals. We will still, in many cases, uh, not all of our cases, but continue to use cafeterias, in some cases classrooms. Uh, in other cases, honestly, we might use an auditorium. Uh, you know, we, we kind of committed to the fact that we didn't want lunch to be the thing that prevented us from bringing kids back. So that's where we said we're going to get creative, and we worked again with our teachers. Our administrators led the charge on this with our buildings and grounds department and teachers. And uh, I, you know, I think we've come up with something that's going to work in every one of our buildings. So when you talk, again, just getting back to this, your meals, lunch, snacks, and all those things, anytime students are eating, they can take their masks off to do that, just like they currently can, but they need to be six feet apart. So again, just various locations that we're going to be using. So another, I, I would say, a pretty substantial change is the CDC and then the New York State in turn, uh, Department of Health uh, basically has said that physical barriers, like the, uh, the shields that we have, they're, they're really not recommending those as a mitigation strategy. You know, we've been in contact with the Erie County Department of Health, and they've not indicated that it's going to be a problem to have them up, but they're saying, let's not take any, any level of comfort with these. Um, you know, in certain places, you know, depending on where you're at, like if you're a speech pathologist or working with a student or maybe uh, one of our, our clerks, you know, in the main office is having a shield or a teacher desk or strategically between some student desks, you know, they still felt as though that could be appropriate. Uh, so they're not telling us rip every single barrier down. They're just saying they're not helping you as much as you think they are. Uh, therefore, that's not a mitigation strategy that they're recommending. So we're going to be working to phase those out largely, but it's not that we're just taking them all away right now. So. Face masks, uh, those are still going to be a must. Uh, and, you know, when somebody had asked the question about, you know, well, what about mask breaks? We're, getting, again, going to be creative with those mask breaks. You know, if kids are three feet apart, we're going to be working to, you know, look for opportunities outside or when kids are maybe more distanced than that to be able to get those mask breaks. Uh, I think our students, to their credit, have been very compliant uh, with, you know, wearing their masks wherever they are. And I think, I expect that will continue. Uh, and I think, honestly, people have also become used to wearing them to some extent. They've just kind of become the norm. And I love the creativity. Some kids have <laughs> some pretty great masks uh, that we've been seeing as well. So, and as always, we, we will have face masks available. You know, a student comes in and forgot their face mask. It's not that we're sending them home. So here, we've got one in the office for you. 
So another area, and this really isn't a change, uh, you know, ventilation and filtration, having appropriate uh, ventilation and filtration has always been something that's a requirement, even well before COVID-19. Uh, we're required uh, by New York State law to have our, it's called a MERV level, a MERV number of 13, MERV 13. If our superintendent for buildings and grounds was here right now, he could tell me what MERV means, but ultimately it's just a level of filtration. Uh, we are uh, in compliance uh, with that requirement, which is important. Uh, but one of the things they're recommending is making sure that you open up windows. Um, you know, st strategically, we have purchased, we, this is not new, but we are getting some more, but some air purifiers, maybe for some of our areas that don't have windows. Uh, and the one thing I will say, too, is that uh, all of our areas, we, we are required in a normal year to basically turn the air over completely in a, in a particular space uh, four times per hour. Um, since the pandemic, our district, along really with every other district, has, you know, it's, our air handlers are basically continually changing air now. So it's, they're basically continually running. Um, so that in combination with having things like windows open, and in some cases, if it's safe to have a door open or something like that, uh, you know, we feel is going to provide the level of uh, you know, safety that we need to be able to have. So it's just a matter of you know, just keeping good circulation. I think what they're saying is let's not focus so much on surfaces. Let's not focus on having barriers. Let's just make sure we have some good ventilation. Um, I've seen some pretty interesting graphics where they've showed you know, like, uh, you know, the, how the air circulation operates with even just one window open in a classroom. It really does make a significant difference. So we're going to continue to maintain our level of compliance with that and also to make sure that we're giving our students plenty of opportunities to be outside as well which again I think if you had a tour one of our buildings maybe back in February when we had our air handlers 100% open it, it got a little chilly but you know fortunately for us we're getting into a warmer time of the year and I think that's going to be of great benefit to us because we'll be able to keep the, the, uh, the windows open. So field trips was another area, I can tell you, that you know, basically we haven't been doing, really doing field trips this year. And that's something that we're going to kind of, you know, again, hold off on for now. Uh, we're trying to minimize the amount of travel that takes place. Now, to some degree, we still have athletics and things like that going on. It, it's all districts, the county, everyone's trying to find kind of a happy medium, trying to instill some level of normalcy while maintaining a level of safety at the same time. So, um, you know, just like with anything, I can tell you that we're going to be able to, con we're going to continue monitoring infection rates within the area, and that really is going to drive our decisions. That in consultation with uh, the Erie County Health Department, who uh, has been accessible to us. So, you know, we have a nurse coordinator in the district, we have administrators in the district that are in routine communication with the health department, uh, and that's been very beneficial to us. So. At the end of the day, uh, you know, there's, a, there's quite a bit, I guess, that you know, we want to be able to talk about, but I did want to make sure I got to some specific questions. So I'm going to go ahead and put on my glasses here, which I now unfortunately need every time I want to look at anything that's within arm's length. Um, so these are questions that were actually emailed into us from families. And I just, uh, I, there's, there's a list of them here. And again, some of them I may, I may have already answered. I apologize if I'm repeating anything, but I don't want to miss anything. And I also want to say, too, this isn't to ask now or for, for forever hold your peace sort of situation. Ultimately, uh, our, we are available. If you have a question, contact your building principal. If you have a question you want to ask me, email me, call me. We are accessible to our community if you do have questions on things, too. And I can tell you that once we do finalize this plan, we're going to submit it to the New York State Department of Health. We will upload it to the uh, Erie County Health Department's web. They have a, a website. And we'll have it on our own website as well, right on the home page. So, and again, it's just, it's more of just updating the current plan that we have here right now. So, uh, one of the questions uh, that was asked, uh, and I, I'm just going to, right now this plan that we're talking about, again, focuses on elementary, but uh, we are basically at this point, our students that are the hybrid model, our fully remote students are still our fully remote students, and we will talk a little bit about them. Uh, but as far as the students that are coming back, we're looking to bring back four days per week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, for our students in the elementary buildings that are in the hybrid model uh, of instruction, the hybrid instructional model. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into this here. So uh, one of the questions that people asked is, why is it that we can't do five days per week? Uh, at this point in time, we're saying we can't do five days per week. We are going to continue. We're going to assess that over the next few weeks. Some of the barriers that we've encountered with that really do revolve around the schedule. We have compressed our elementary schedule uh, to a degree to be able to account for the extra time that it takes for us to accomplish dismissal. Uh, we have a number of parents transporting students, which is very helpful, I will say, because it reduces bus density for us. Uh, but one of the, the, the drawbacks is it takes a little bit of time uh, to get the kids in the buildings. Now, I think we, you know, our folks have done an exceptional job in developing strategies and structures to be able to have a safe uh, dismissal time and arrival time for our uh, students. Um, and parents have been very patient, which I, again, I, I think I even in a couple of weeks ago did a video just thanking our parents for doing that. 
Um, but that's one of our issues. So if we were to go back to a regular, to, to the five days a week, we would have to uh, you know, expand our schedules to some degree. We also have special areas and related service providers like speech pathologists. When I say special areas, that's phys ed and art and music. You know, we really have, we, you know, we started off the year very, we just wanted to make sure we had as efficient of a schedule as possible in order for us to be able to start and bring Wednesdays into the fold. We're going to have to, you know, readjust their schedules, which we are looking at, but, but frankly, with working with the students that are in the remote, remote model as well as the students that are, you know, in person, uh, for some of these related service providers and some of these special area teachers, uh, it's going to be a very big lift for us to be able to do that to the point that, you know, we also have to still be able to provide, you know, our teachers, you know, with the appropriate time to be able to plan, you know, for their days and during their days and to give people opportunities to eat lunch, things like that. So there's, there's a variety of challenges. We're not saying we're not going to go to five days. We're saying we can't do it at this point in time. So, so I'm going to jump back into another question. I'm kind of going in some order here, so I may jump around a little, but uh, somebody asked a question about busing. They said, I currently drive my child, but now I, I've realized that if it's four days a week, I'm going to need to use the bus. Call the transportation department. Um, they, they, all, the, all of our students are routed. You know, we started off the year basically assuming that every child was taking a bus, and we've, we've created routes to that effect. So uh, contact the, the, the bus department or the bus, uh, bus garage for that. Uh, somebody asked the question, my child uh, rides in hybrid. Now, I never even thought of this question, but it's a good question. Um, they just go, you know, Monday and Tuesday. Do I need to contact the transportation department if they want the transportation on Thursday and Friday as well? The answer is no. Uh, I've checked directly with uh, Mrs. O'Grady, our director of transportation. Just have your child go out there. They're already routed if they're out there for that Thursday, Friday, and we were picking them up on Monday and Tuesday. The drivers will know to stop and pick up your child. So great question. I never would have thought of it. That's the benefit of having, you know, some input and feedback from our families on this. All right, I'm going to keep moving along here. Uh, we did have a good, uh, another good question as well. Somebody had asked the question uh, about our fifth grade on the east side of town. They're in a middle school. And someone said, well, why can't the fifth grade on the east side of town come back in? Unfortunately, they're in a middle school, so the regulations from the New York State Department of Health are different for middle school students. Uh, and as I said earlier, we're not able to cohort them and so that they travel in one little, in little packs. Therefore, we're just not able to bring the middle school students uh, at east middle back in the same way that we would, uh, you know, on the fifth graders on the west side of town. Somebody asked the question, can high school students come back four days? And as I, I'd said before, we just, we're not in a position to be able to do that right now as much as we want to, as much as our teachers and our administrators and everyone wants our students back, we just can't at this point. Um, and again, somebody asked the question about why can't you cohort? I just got done telling you, you know, we can't cohort at the secondary level. There's just such a diversity of classes that exists. Uh, elementary teacher certifications are very broad. Uh, elementary teachers are jacks and chains of all trades. They, they, can, te they can teach it all, um, and in some cases do. Uh, at the secondary level, they have very specific certification areas. Uh, and in some cases, it's, it's not just science. It's, it's chemistry certifications and things like that. Uh, and kids have different needs and course requirements. Um, which, why, which is what makes it so challenging and which is why you really don't see kids in like high schools and rarely in middle schools traveling in this way or being scheduled in this way. So, all right. One of the other big questions that people had too was the fact that we are moving toward, we're moving away from the live casting model at elementary buildings, very similar to what we did with our kindergarten and first grade students when we brought them back in. Um, the, you know, big picture, uh, this is a situation where we were faced with two tough decisions, or two tough choices, I should say, and we had to make a decision in one way or the other. Um, our folks, our elementary folks, have done a phenomenal job with the live casting model. I'm very proud of the fact that we have been able to have five days of instruction for our students since the start of the school year. Um, the increase, and as I had said earlier, with the kindergarten and first grade students, Having this, this significantly adding bodies to our classrooms, bringing more kids into the classrooms is going to make it uh, that much more challenging for our, for our teachers to be able to really give the students on the screens and in front of them the attention that they deserve. Um, you know, and to be honest with you, some of the feedback that we'd receive from our kindergarten and first grade students, which obviously are much younger kids, but is when the kids came together, it was almost like kind of starting the school year, you know, almost over a little bit in some ways, just in helping the kids all kind of learn to operate and navigate within a, you know, a, a much more different classroom environment. So we felt we owed it to our students to be able to create opportunities for uh, our students, both in person and remote, to have people that, that they're going to be giving them their undivided attention. And our numbers, uh, frankly, as far as remote, were good enough that we were able to do that. Uh, at this point, we have uh, basically created positions, and people are going to be work. Our teachers are going to be working with uh, all of our students. We didn't, you know, we didn't. We're going to be set to go for next week. 
uh, you know, starting next Monday, we'll be ready to go with having teachers designated to those fully remote students. Um, somebody even asked the question about like, hey, did, did you have any conversation with our teachers about that? And, and we did. As much as our teachers don't want to let go of their students at the elementary level, they, are, they too are faced with difficult decisions. And frankly, it was, you know, felt we need to take that decision off their plate and just say, this is what we're going to be doing here. We need to do this for the benefit of our students. Again, we're in a pandemic. Uh, we've been faced with any number of difficult choices. And, you know, sometimes the choice that you pick is just the, the less bad one. I hate to word it that way. But I do think the benefit here is going to be that all of our students are going to get the attention that they deserve. Um, one of the analogies I, I made last night at our Board of Education meeting when I discussed this was, you know, in any given year, I mean, you know, Unfortunately, teachers have to go out, or fortunately and unfortunately, uh, for different for medical leaves or maternity leaves, things like that. It, it happens on a yearly basis that there are a number of teachers that just do because that's just life. That's how it works. And our students, we always work to ensure, ensure a nice, smooth transition, and I'm confident that we're going to be able to make this work for our students as well uh, that are fully remote uh, as they transition to some of the new teachers, too. Somebody else asked a good question, too. They said, geez, are, are you using, like, reading specialists and AI, you know, your reading specialists to to be able to, to fill these positions, and we're really not. The people, the vast majority of the people that are the teachers that are gonna be filling these fully remote positions are people that have been doing some work with us, whether it's preferred building subs or you know, in some other capacity, or maybe a teaching assistant, they've served us and know the district pretty well, uh, but they have been with us for a little while in most cases, and we're still maintaining our reading program and our reading intervention uh, services and things like that. Um, Somebody asked too, they said, you know, wondering if, you know, our class sizes were, were really big, did that have an impact? Frankly, at our elementary levels, our class sizes, we've been working over the past few years to try to knock down the class sizes, especially at the primary grades. I can tell you that it would have been very challenging. We wouldn't have been able to bring our kindergarten and first grade students back four days a week when we did if we didn't have very nice class sizes at those levels. And in our elementaries in general, we've, we've tried to have, you know, good sized classes, so they're, they're not unusually large or anything like that, so. Uh, one of the questions, too, was when will parents find out who the teacher is? Uh, over the next, some, many parents have heard today from the fully remote teachers. Uh, in other cases, they'll hear tomorrow, maybe by Friday at the latest, but uh, these people will be making contact, these teachers will be making contact, if they haven't already, uh, with uh, families and students, and they're very eager and excited. I had a chance to speak to a, a few folks that are just very excited to get the opportunity to work with, you know, our students for the rest of the year and be a part of the community, so... Um, somebody asked a question too, I wouldn't have thought about this one, but they're asking where are the remote teachers going to be teaching from? Um, so that's going to depend, <laughs> very depending on the building, so, but in some cases, uh, somebody asked, are they just taking up an entire classroom? One person is not going to occupy by themselves an entire classroom. In some cases, they might work within a classroom or, you know, an office space or something like that, but uh, they're not going to be, it's not going to be just one person sitting in a giant class, 720 foot classroom by themselves. If we had that kind of space, we'd be using it differently, so, and we just, we frankly don't have that too. Another question that we had was, will the remote learners have interaction with their peers? Absolutely they will. Uh, they'll, they'll get a chance to meet some new peers, maybe potentially from some other, you know, from another building or something along those lines. But they're still going to have opportunities to be able to interact. Actually, I will say um, too, you know, in terms of just a, you know, the, the smoothing this transition over the next couple of weeks with the Wednesdays, uh, you know, in play as far as our, you know, our teachers right now is still, you know, keeping that remote. Uh, those teachers are going to be working to, co you know, continuing to collaborate with the existing teachers of our children as well. So that's going to be another, you know, I guess sort of unintended benefit or, you know, consequence in, in a good way uh, to be able to help maintain a smooth level of transition for our students. So. Um, so a couple of questions here I thought were interesting as well. Somebody had said, what if I you know, have a child, I'm in fully remote, but I really want my child to come back in for this. And to be quite honest with you, I've been saying consistently that if that's a desire that you have, contact the building principal. And our building principals, for the most part, in most cases, have been able to make accommodations. Now, we do get to a point where... We, we don't have the space, but we're going to continue to work and try and be creative to try to, you know, to, to get you where you need to be. So what I would again just say is if that's a desire that you have, please contact the building principals, but understand that ultimately it comes down to the level of space. So, but I would also add that the conversation doesn't always have to end there. I think in some cases a parent, you know, I, at least I've encountered a parent or two that has said, I want my child back. And when we've kind of said, okay, well, talk to me a little bit about what the, the, the issue is. It wasn't so much that they necessarily wanted them back as that there was some other issue that they maybe wanted to, to some assistance in working through. And, and you know, so I guess what I'm saying is if for some reason you were to contact a building principal and, and uh, you know, maybe there wasn't room right now at the moment, you know, that's not to say that we still can't do some things to try to make things better. So that's why I would say is let's not stop the conversation. 
um, somebody else asked the question, uh, and they said, you know what, I, maybe, you know, I'm thinking I might want my child to switch to fully remote uh, that's currently in hybrid. And my, uh, my, I guess my response there would be the same. Contact the building principal just to see if that may be an option for you. So, um, again, you can never go wrong by talking to the building principal. They have the best uh, grasp on their respective buildings. So, um, and then another question, too, somebody asked uh, was, you know, my child likes hybrid where they go to school a couple days a week and, and, and you know, then the rest of the week they're, they're learning remotely. Can they continue to maintain this? Um, in this particular situation, I just I have to say that's not something that we're going to be able to accommodate. Uh, you, you'd have to pick one or the other. So it's either you're going to be, you know, in fully remote or you're going to be coming into school Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. So let's see what else we've got here. All right. Um, one of the questions, too, somebody had just said, hey, you know, I, I understand that, you know, things like lunches, and I think I referenced this earlier, you know, uh, when will we see, like, the individual building plans? I can tell you that, you know, we've created the infrastructure, or the, the, the structures to be able to secure, have lunches and meals in all of our buildings. It's going to look different building to building, and I can tell you what we're doing one week might change a little bit the following week or even the following day. So there's going to be a level of fluidity, but we are committed to maintaining that safe social distance uh, for our students. And if you have a concern about that, again, I, I mean, you can contact me, you can contact the building principal, but ultimately, I guess what I'm saying is it's going to look, it may look a little bit different day to day. You know, in one day, if it's a nice day outside, you might see a teacher take this class and sit outside in the grass and have a picnic lunch. It's another day, if it's raining, well, then maybe they, they're defaulting to, you know, the classroom or the gymnasium uh, or the tents or whatever it would be. So that really is going to be very much building dependence. Okay, uh, I did talk a little bit about mass breaks. Somebody had just said, geez, you know, what's, what's the protocol going to be? They're three feet apart. Are they still going to, again, I'm going to tell you that, you know, we're going to work mass breaks into the day so that students have opportunities to take them off with the nicer weather. It's going to be even easier to be able to accomplish that. Um, somebody did ask a question, too. Are you going to, you know, have additional staff, like a teacher aide in every classroom to ensure that kids keep their masks on? I'm going to tell you, I mentioned this earlier, but we have, uh, our students have really stepped up. And I think maybe they, they, they see the value, you know, in, in being there, the ones that are there. And they've been very good about making sure that they keep their masks on. So we, we won't be securing additional staff to monitor masks and things like that. The teacher's perfectly capable if a student takes their mask off inappropriately to say put it back on. And again, we really haven't had issues with that. Our kids have been great. All right, another question we have, too. Somebody was just asking, and I love that we're thinking forward because I can tell you we are right now, but they were asking about kindergarten screenings. Um, so, you know, every year we're required legally to perform, conduct kindergarten screenings, basically just getting a, a look at students before they, you know, or as they kind of enter in kindergarten. Uh, you know, so that's something that we're going to continue to, to do. You know, we've, we've done it every year. We'll continue to do it. So um, another question was about lunch pickups. Uh, right now, you know, we have, you know, the free lunches are available. And uh, actually, Dr. Cervoni just sent me a, a link this morning. He, he caught it first. I think it was about 4.30 in the morning he sent me the link. But uh, basically saying that, um, lunches are going to be uh, free, I believe, right through June, 20, June of 2022. So basically, the, the free lunch program that we have, we're, we're going to be able to continue to offer that through the summer and right into next year. So lunches, will, we still will have pickups. All right. Another question about ventilation, and I can tell you that to just, I'm sorry, I'm going down my list. I know I already covered that. So. Somebody asked the question about are we considering extending the school year? Um, you know, at this point, I, I'm going to say that it's kind of a mixed answer. You know, from an official standpoint, I'm saying, okay, the school year is not going to end at the end of June. It's going to end, you know, in July or August. No, we're, we're not looking at that. I can tell you there'd be a number of issues that go along with that. Um, you know, but, but ultimately the big picture is we are looking to offer some summer programming. So we, we've consistently over the past several years had middle and high school kind of credit recovery programs. We can, we're going to be offering those again. Uh, one thing that we haven't had in a while, we've had the LEAP program. Uh, at the elementary level. Can somebody tell me what LEAP stands for? <laughs> I forget. Learning Education. I should know that as a superintendent. I apologize. It's basically it's a great reading program that we have for our elementary students. So, uh, But we've been running that over the past uh, several years with great success. Um, but we're also going to be looking to reinstitute a summer elementary program. So that's not something we've had in a little while. Uh, the details are still kind of being developed on that. We have a pretty good sense of what we want to be able to do, but we are going to be creating opportunities for our elementary students in a summer program. You know, very heavy emphasis on reading and math. We'll work with our teachers and administrators to identify appropriate, you know, candidates for that. In addition to the LEAP program, which has been very successful over the years in helping students stay engaged academically. So, um, you know, big. Big picture here, you know, while we're not extending the school year, we're going to be creating opportunities for our students to stay engaged over the summer. Uh, so more to come with that. 
Okay. Uh, somebody asked a question about students with IEPs who are integrated. So this is, they were focusing more, I think, on the high school in this particular question. But uh, they had asked, you know, if students that have IEPs uh, and that are in our integrated programs, meaning that they, they participate in their special education programming, you know, in like the general education setting. So they're in a regular algebra class and it's just a, a special education teacher that kind of pushes in and, and helps to provide some support. So uh, somebody was asking, can we maybe try to bring some of those students back? Because we have been uh, bringing kids back, you know, just in gradual waves. We've been trying to, we've been identifying new flexibility, uh, you know, in our elementaries and, you know, in, in, you know, middle schools, high schools with students, for instance, in some of our uh, self-contained classrooms, um, we've been bringing in like five days a week. So I can tell you that the answer is possibly. We are assessing, we're continually looking for new flexibility that we may have. So there is some possibility that the secondary level, uh, specifically we were looking at some of the high schools and middle schools that we might be able to potentially offer some an increase in the amount of in-person time. I, I'm not promising something right now. I can tell you it's something that we are carefully evaluating though. Mrs. Fowler is working with our uh, administrators to see if that's something we might be able to accomplish. So. Um, the, the, one of the part of that question too was there was a concern over the regents exams. So I, I think the some good news there as far as regents exams and state assessments in general. But I, I guess I'll speak to the regents is the state has off, afforded us a great deal and other school districts a great deal of flexibility uh, to students in terms of the regents exams. So there's four regents exams that are required right now. I say required: earth science, algebra, living environment, and the English language arts uh, exam that kids typically take in their junior year. Uh, so. Those exams, students really will have an option. If they're passing all of their, they're passing the course, they have an option to take those exams. They don't necessarily need to take them. Uh, and there's gonna be more communication we'll be sending out about that. But basically it's, it's kind of a do no harm sort of approach that the state seems to be taking and we're gonna take full advantage of that as well. In the other subject areas, we're gonna be working to you know, offer locally administered assessments. Again, more communication you know, has and will be coming out about that as well. So, but we're working to try to support our students, give them opportunities to be successful. So another question we had too, and I thought this was a really good one too, especially if you see some of our little ones, uh, Chromebooks, they said, do Chromebooks need to come every day? And there was some concern with like the weight of the backpacks. What I will say is that's something that, I mean, we've, we've, we, are, we have moved to one-to-one, -one, you know, device. You know, we did that very quickly, but so we use the Chromebooks quite a bit. That said, it's going to be the, 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 the teachers will be communicating with families and students on the degree to which you should be carrying them back and forth and, you know, as well as other materials. We are sensitive to the fact that we don't want to load up these guys' backpacks, you know, especially our, our very little ones going back and forth. So that is something that we are sensitive to. Uh, so we're not sending home every single textbook and the Chromebook every single night. Um, but it's, you know, it'll be what needs to go home, basically. Another question about uh, quarantines. So somebody had said, hey, are there, are there still travel restrictions? And the good news here at this point, I guess, um, if you want to travel, is that there are no travel restrictions right now. At one point in time, you had to quarantine for a certain period of time if you came from out of state or overseas. Um, those don't exist anymore. So here's a big question, and I know this is a question in the hearts and minds of, of everyone, you know, throughout, you know, really, you know, that, that, this, that this would affect other districts as well. You know, what happens, there's kind of two questions. What happens if my child uh, is quarantined? You know, they're in person, they're quarantined, they can't come to school. I will say typically those quarantines, you know, that's about a 10 day or something along those lines at most, sometimes they're less, and they almost always, they're going to include some weekend time and whatnot. Um, typically speaking, you're talking about a few school days at most, maybe a week. Um, we are gonna work to try to make connection between our teachers and students, our hybrid, te our, our, sorry, our in-person teachers and the students. Um, so I can't say exactly what that's gonna look like. It also depends too, is it an entire class being quarantined? Is it just a couple of students being quarantined? We're gonna work to get creative. Um, you know, if a student's home, you know, or if they're just ill, that was the other question. What if they're just ill and they have to miss a day of school or something along those lines? You know, it's probably gonna operate very similar to if your child was ill in a normal circumstance. So there might be some communication, uh, you know, with the child or, you know, they, you know, sending some packets and things like that or emailing and, you know, working in Google Classroom and things like that. Um, you know, but ultimately, you know, we're still gonna, we're still responsible, we're still gonna take care of the kids, we're still gonna work to try to maintain connections. The one thing I, I, I think I would be negligent if I didn't manage is that the, uh, and this is not just the Erie County Health Department, I, I watched a webinar la uh, last week and the New York State Department of Health has indicated that contact tracing is still gonna take place using the six foot rule. So what that means is that, you know, even though our students can be three feet apart, that the three feet, they're not considering it to be you're, you're exempt from quarantine. Right now, kind of like how, how, how it has operated in the past is if, hey, somebody was six feet apart and wearing a mask, they were at a lesser risk of being quarantined if they were near somebody that tested positive. 
in this circumstance, uh, the, the county health department in their contact tracing process is still going to use a six-foot rule. So for our adults, that's a different story because they are going to maintain six feet of distance, but the kids will be three feet apart. So um, it was, you know, my understanding that there may be a greater chance that if a quarantine were to take place in a classroom, there's a, there's a good chance that it's just going to be the entire class that would be quarantined. In that case, I think as long as the teacher was not symptomatic, was healthy, you know, we probably work to be able to, you know, to maintain some virtual connection between that teacher and the students. Be, you know, in some, some senses, actually be a little bit easier in that regard because it would be everybody doing the same thing. So, uh, Another question that we had, too, is about the before and after school program. Somebody just said, hey, now with more kids coming back, can you open more slots for the before and after school program? And I'm going to defer this to uh, Mrs. Wright. She is our before and after school program coordinator. And I know she's already fielded some phone calls from some of our families. Uh, so that is something that's, you know, again, basically I would say pick up the phone, give a call if that's something that you need. If you don't have it currently or if you need to increase the days, pick up the phone and make a phone call. All right. So I'm wondering, I've gotten through really kind of the, the, the questions that are related to, you know, the reopening at this point. I'm just wondering if we had any other questions that are being emailed in live at this point. I got a live one. I um, have a question regarding the before and after school program and will additional spots be available? I will tell you that I have spoken with Mrs. Wright, our before and after school coordinator. And she said there are spots, they are limited, that she still is under the same restrictions, but that if you reach out to her at 677-3180, she is willing to work with families to accommodate their needs while staying within the safety guidelines. So each building's a little different, but if you call our community ad office at 677-3180, um, there are some spots available, and she does understand there could be an additional need with this increase. All right, thanks for elaborating. You have more information than I do at this point, so thank you. Do we have other questions coming in? Just yeah. a general question about how to reinforce the rules on the bus. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up. I haven't really touched on transportation a whole lot. I did last night at the board meeting, but I want to just be able to speak to that a little bit more now. So you know, we're going to work to space kids out as much as humanly possible on our buses. Uh, you know, really the way that we want it to work is if, you know, siblings or people living in the same household should sit together in their seats. Uh, other than that, we're going to space out as much as we can. Um, once we you know, kind of get rolling, uh, we will also be continually assessing. We may make some route adjustments, uh, you know, depending on, you know, who starts utilizing transportation. So, you know, big picture, that is something that we're going to be doing. And in terms of how we're going to, you know, maintain those rules, our bus drivers are very much aware. And again, kids have been very compliant for the most part on our school buses. We're going to have windows open, the roof fence open, uh, which is what has been recommended to us to keep kids safely on buses. Um, so, you know, ultimately it's just going to come down to our bus drivers continuing to reinforce the expectations. I have another one for you, Mr. Bystrack. Um, there was a comment regarding uh, there was a shift where we were initially we were going to live cast at fifth grade on the west side of town and then we pivoted. Maybe you could speak to that and how are we ensuring um, to the degree possible equity with regards to fifth graders uh, and the east side versus those on the west side? Okay, great question. Yeah, initially we were not going to be, uh, we were going to continue live casting with fifth grade. Fifth grade, I will say, now you've got one half of town, and the east side is in middle school, and the other side is in the elementary school. So three of our fifth grade uh, programs take place uh, in elementary buildings, and, and then the other one's over at East Middle. Um, the, the issue there initially why we were thinking that we, it was going to be difficult to do this is just because they're very much what we would call departmentalized. Teachers teach specific content areas, uh, and that's, very, that, that's a bit of a challenge to be able to uh, find people that can live cast according to that schedule, uh, or I'm sorry, that, that we'd be able to film with strictly remote teachers. Uh, through some creative work through our, actually our principals kind of got their heads together on this. We did find a way to be able to make this work. Uh, and we felt as though it was important to be able to offer that same benefit to the other kids in the elementary building. Now, as much as we, you know, we try to offer a level of parity between the fifth grades on both sides of town, and from a curricular and instructional standpoint, I would say we, they largely are comparable programs. Just the structures, uh, the physical makeups of, you know, of, of the classes and everything and the way the schedules run, there is some difference. So, again, curricularly, they're, they're, they're doing the same thing. Instructionally, they really are doing the same thing. 
Um, so we're going to continue to make sure basically, obviously the kids in the East Middle School, fifth grade, it's not a secret, they're not going to be able to come back at the same level, but we do believe that they are still getting, you know, obviously the instructional and the curricular support uh, that the kids on the west side of town are getting as well. So, you know, it's just it's taking place remotely. So uh, that's something that is always, you know, because we have this sort of difference in the way we've operated, we've always had to take some special steps to make sure that we have a good line of communication uh, between, you know, both sides of town and how their fifth grades operate. A few questions, um, Mr. Vice Jack, regarding social emotional well being of our students and what might be some of the resources or supports that we will afford to students as they return and if they don't return or still remote. Yeah, that's a great question. I would say one of the things that I think we've had a great emphasis on over the years, and I will say this myself, being a former school social worker, um, is that we have a pretty robust program or network of support from a social emotional standpoint for our students. You know, we have social worker in every building. We have psychologists, eight, eight psychologists for nine buildings. We have school counselors, you know, at all levels at this point that provide that. The one thing I would say, though, is that, you know, we, we understand that I just listed a number of people, and those... 6,000 students, and I just, you know, I gave you a finite number of individuals. So the approach we really tried to take is that everyone can be a resource. Everyone can, you know, be of benefit and support to a student. Uh, and to be honest with you, if you go into education, you work in a school, you know, that's just something that speaks to you naturally. I mean, some of the steps that we've taken, uh, we've had a trauma-informed instructional practices program with University of Buffalo, partnership that we've, you know, utilized throughout the course of the year. I think it's valuable, but that provides our teachers with some strategies uh, to be able to support students, you know, socially, emotionally. Um, and actually, somebody had even asked this question, so I'm glad you brought this up. I, I don't think I got to it, but, you know, initially at the beginning of the year, one of the things that we did for quite a while, actually, to the point that some parents said, I think we're good for now, um, but we had sort of developed a pod system so our principals kind of work together with their staff to break up all the students in each school into groups and you know our folks teachers people you know clerks you know whomever were making phone calls pretty much on a weekly basis I think maybe it was emails whatever but reaching out to families how's it going is there anything that you need um, you know we kind of phased that out a little bit because really we reached kind of a critical mass where people were saying you can stop calling now we're doing okay or they'd already been linked with the resources uh, that they needed to we're also very fortunate to have a number of different local organizations counseling agencies and whatnot throughout the area uh, that we work very closely with um, that support our students as well and it's not that we just give a referral let's say it's a you know somebody has a, an issue with substance abuse or something like that you know we don't just contact kids escaping drugs and say okay they're yours we maintain a level of communication with those programs to ensure that do you have recommendations as a professional like clinical psychologist we want to know what your recommendations are in school so and then staying in communication with the families we have structures just an example for instance at the middle school level where they have team a team structure where the, the team gets together on a you know daily basis essentially to be able to look and review and support students, um, you know, like if they, whatever those needs are, they're academically, they're social, emotional. So it really comes down to a great deal of communication. Um, and then again, just always continually looking to see what's next, what's around the corner, trying to be proactive. Um, I can tell you that, you know, our folks, it is not uncommon at all for, you know, building principal to get a phone call or like, you know, or, you know, director of pupil service or somebody get a phone call on a Saturday night that something took place in a neighborhood, they got wind of it, or hey, I saw this going on on social, and, and, and they jump into action and they're, they're on the phone with the police or they're contacting families, you know, uh, you know at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. So, you know, the, these aren't, uh, I mean, and I, I don't think I have to tell anybody this, but, you know, the folks that are working here, you know, within our district, they don't, they don't leave their, their students, at, you know, in school when they come home for the night or on the weekend. All right, so they, you know, we're continually looking out for our folks. Also, a great, you know, partnership with the West Seneca Police too, so that we have that direct line of communication. That if one of our social workers reaches out to the, you know, the police department, they don't have to explain who they are and say, "This is why you need to take me seriously." You know, if one of our social workers or you know, principals reaches out and you know talks to whether it's a school resource officer or somebody at the police department, they're already there. They, they, I get it. I know who you are. We'll look into it, or we'll take care of it. So. Sorry, that was probably a little more long-winded than it needed to be. So, Did we have other questions? Um, there's a few questions regarding individual building plans. Since mm -hmm. the buildings are each so different, when might those plans become available? So we're looking to be able to post. If you notice this, uh, the, the plan we put out there, like this, this update is a draft. We're looking to be able to put our plans out 
uh, probably tomorrow. Within the next day or two, we'll probably have those out. We'll definitely have them out this week. Um, and I can tell you again, if there were specific questions that somebody had, uh, I think they should reach out the actual, to the actual building principal to get some specifics. As I had said, like for lunches, for instance, you know, it very well may be, you know, if you say, you know, list tents, cafeteria, you know, classrooms, and you say, which is it? The answer is going to be yes. <laughs> it could be all three of those things. Uh, so, but again, that's really going to depend largely on where we're at uh, in our individual buildings. Uh, just, just a few emails coming in, just in and around Wednesday. Mm -hmm. That uh, it often it's only a couple hours of instruction. Do we ever see that changing? Um, some maybe have specials, some haven't been getting specials, and why is it different? And um, you know, will we ever pivot from that, or will they get more potential? instructional time, whether it be remote or in person on Wednesday? Uh, I could see potentially for us to be able to increase the instructional time. As of this point right now, though, you know, we are using that time to, in many cases, provide for whether it be related services, if they're doing virtual, uh, you know, uh, relate like speech, you know, OT, things like that. Um, you know, some of our specials in many of our buildings are taking place, you know, on those Wednesdays. Um, you know, like as I said, for the first couple of weeks at least, I know some of our teachers that are going to be the fully remote teachers are going to be collaborating uh, with their other, their counterparts, the kids, you know, the teachers that, you know, form that they are receiving students from to make sure that they're in line, you know, from a curricular standpoint and understanding the individual needs that a student or students uh, might have. So, you know, with the Wednesdays, again, I know that's a big thing on people's minds, and I know, you know, our district, you know, along with a few others are still maintaining the remote Wednesdays for now. That is something that we're going to continue to assess. Question came in regarding the increased number of students. Will we be staggering pickup, drop-off time by building by grade level? You know, as of this point, um, we're going to try to you know make work with our you know current schedule. The issue is, you know, we <laughs> we already have four tiers of you know uh, busing that takes place within the district. Two of them at the elementary level. You know, we don't. You know, we understand parents. You know, maybe have to get to work or childcare arrangements and things like that. We also don't want kids coming into school at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I will also say too, just it comes down to you know we have a finite number of buses and drivers as well uh, that we have that we can tap into. As far as parents picking up and dropping off, you know, I think the structure that we have in place right now is going to work pretty well. Our you know our folks have been assessing, um, you know, what that looks like. And we've worked very closely with the West Seneca Police to ensure some, you know, some good lines of traffic here. Again, our parents have been very patient. If we needed to make some sort of an adjustment to that, we certainly would. Uh, but right now, this the way that the structure we have it set up is our kids get into school at a good time and they're leaving at a good time. So uh, I guess I would say at this point, I'm not ruling anything out, but right now we're going to try to make work with, with our current structure that we have. It, it comes, it's, it's, <laughs> it's intense for that short period, relatively short period of time, but then it, you know, I think people have it down now. Our, our families and our, our staff have it down pretty well right now. Uh, I know one of our buildings I was looking at, given the fact that I was, you know, thinking the same thing that some of our families are, like, we have a lot more people, but I was actually speaking with one of our principals, and it really won't result in that many more cars because a lot of the kids that are coming back are siblings of kids that are already in, you know, coming in four days uh, per week. So it's not necessarily, you know, like if they've got a, a sibling in kindergarten or first grade. So that cuts down on the numbers right there. So. Other questions? So there were a couple that weren't necessarily related to reopening, but I've got an audience here, so I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, chime in on them anyway. Somebody asked about graduation plans. Um, so here's the thing, and some know, may know this already, but I can tell you that, you know, uh, in case you haven't noticed, we have a great new athletic facility, uh, a big, big stadium over at East Senior High School. So East Fully intend, fully, East Senior High School fully intends to take advantage of their stadium to be able to hold an in-person graduation. Uh, there are some very specific requirements and guidelines that must be met, uh, but we have been working in very close collaboration with our nurse coordinator, our director of pupil services, Mrs. Fowler, our building principals, teach, I mean, everybody's kind of working together, communicating with the Department of Health so that we can have a safe in-person graduation. Uh, East is actually going to be releasing some more specific information, I think, over the next few days uh, related to that. Uh, West is a little different. Right now, they do not have their stadium. They have a big pile of mud right now that's covered in snow. Uh, but that said, they actually had put a kind of a survey out in the community to see. Last year, we did a drive-through graduation, which we honestly got a, a lot of great feedback on. I participated. You know, people loved it. Um, but just want to make sure, because there is a possibility that we could also utilize uh, East's stadium as well. I think we've just turned the E on its side and make it look like a W. I'm kidding. That's not going to happen. But 
that is, they're just exploring, you know, which one might be the best option here. So stay tuned with that. But I guess my, my bottom line is we are looking to have some sort of in-person event for graduation. So just, you know, stay tuned with that. So uh, let's see here. I'm not seeing a lot of other questions that I haven't touched on. I'm just going to make sure I didn't miss anything on my list. Any other questions coming in through email? Seeing some... you haven't really already addressed. Okay. All right. Well, folks, as uh, happened last night, my voice is starting to fade a little bit. I think we've hit everything. Again, this is not a, you know, ask now or forever, hold your peace situation. I can tell you that we're going to continue to communicate with our families. Um, over the next uh, day or so, we're going to be posting our, you know, our updated plans. Uh, I can tell you, though, again, the, the, the big picture here is that not a ton of the guidance has really changed. You know, we still have to make sure that, you know, there's, you know, good sanitizing taking place. You know, the, 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 the focus has really changed more to the air as opposed to surfaces and things like that, though. Um, you know, that, you know, three feet is really the biggest change, and it's a game changer for our elementary schools. So we're very excited uh, to be able to welcome students back for a greater number of days in person. Um, you know, really at the end of the day, I, I, we're talking about two months, uh, but I think it'll be a meaningful two months uh, as we move forward. So I want to thank our guests for being here today. Everybody has incredibly busy schedules right now, and I appreciate everybody uh, you know, taking the time to be here. I want to thank all of our staff, our teachers, all of our you know, custodial staff, our clerks, our administrators, everyone for you know, putting in the time that they have to make this you know, possible, and really not just even this, this next wave of bringing students back, but it's, it's been a tough year, and everyone knows it, and I just am extremely appreciative of everything uh, that, that, you know, that folks have done, and of our community for being so supportive of, you know, and really saying, let's, let's make this work, you know, whether it be, you know, making the fully remote model work for some of our students, or the in-person model work, too, so we look forward to seeing more of our students, we look forward to, you know, finishing the year strong, so anyway, thank you, and uh, look for my next video, it's actually coming out on Friday morning. Have a great afternoon.